Welcome everybody. My name is Bob DeRosa, and I'm gonna to talk to you about Broadridge's journey from on-prem to the cloud with Kubernetes. So just to give you an idea of what we're gonna go through today, um, I'm just posting an agenda. And basically, you know, I'll start out, I'll tell you a little bit about Broadridge. I'll tell you about the project that we completed. Um, we'll go through why we made the switch, uh, how we prepared, the process we went through from moving from on-prem to the cloud. We'll take a look at what we should have done differently, uh, the results of the project. I'll talk a little bit about what's next and I'll provide you with some references from some of the material I talked about. So first, a little bit about Broadridge. Broadridge is the leading provider of investor communications. We're a global FinTech company. We've got over four and a half billion dollars in revenue. We handle millions of trades a day involving trillions of dollars. And when I talk about investor communications, we support communications that reach approximately 75% of the North American households. And investor communications includes things like proxy statements, um, mailings, um, if you've got a, a, any stocks that you own. A lot of times the material that comes for us, from us, whether it's mailed to you or electronic, um, is attributed to Broadridge. You know, we work with a lot of different banks and brokerages and we're their back end. We also have something uh, where we manage shareholder voting. So a proxy vote, if you use that app at all, that's again, powered by Broadridge. Last year, we hosted nearly 2000 virtual shareholder meetings. And uh, shareholder meetings are something that's required by the SEC. Uh, a lot of times they used to be done in person, you know, whether it's uh, at a small venue for smaller companies or even at larger uh, venues and even hotels, things like that for a larger company. Um, it's where the board will go through their annual meeting. They'll present any uh, information that needs to be presented and then they'll hold their voting. Well, because of the pandemic, obviously, uh, this was still a requirement, but um, people were able to take advantage of a broader service that we've had for years. And like I said, there was over 2000 meetings that were held last year. Now we have over 10,000 employees worldwide. And out of that, we've got thousands of technical associates. And if you want more info about Broadridge, you know, here's the URL. Now, as far as my background, um, I started as a software developer, and then uh, I moved on to starting my own company with a couple friends, and I was the CTO of the company. We did educational software uh, and security. Uh, we also, that's my first, uh, trial where I use the Amazon cloud and we put some of the products into the cloud. I later moved on to Broadridge and I worked in a role called service delivery. My responsibility there was managing the products that were um, running in the cloud. We had a couple of products that we put into the cloud. Um, so I managed the infrastructure side of things. Later on, I moved on to the DevOps COE. So we started up a DevOps center of excellence and uh, I was involved in choosing the tools, putting processes in place, and um, just kind of getting the word out to the company about DevOps, how it worked. And uh, then as part of that COE, we looked at moving our tools from on-prem into the cloud. And so I was uh, responsible for um, the technical lead on the team that took those tools and moved them from uh, on-prem into AWS. So the project we're gonna be talking about today, like I said, we migrated our DevOps tools from on-prem into AWS. We have a couple of different tools. You know, we've got Nexus, we've got GitLab, and we have uh, Jenkins, which is known as Cloud BCI. So today I'm specifically gonna talk about Cloud BCI because that we moved into Kubernetes. Now our on-prem CI implementation had around 10 masters 
and around 1,000 agents. Uh, those agents were running on VMs. One of the problems is that uh, because a lot of the masters were shared by different development teams, if one team uh, had a runaway job, it could affect other teams. Another problem was since it was on-prem, if we needed to add resources, uh, it sometimes could take weeks to do that if we needed more disk space or uh, more CPU and stuff like that. Um, because they were all um, VMs, they uh, required a lot of time for maintenance and patching. Now, some of that was done by the DevOps teams, but some of that was done by the development teams, but still everything interacted. And um, like I said, mostly VMs, but there were some agents that were running in AWS. And we even had some uh, older agents that were running things like Solaris. And these agents were located all around the world. So the next question is why we made the switch. So first of all, you know, why the cloud? Um, we've got a corporate direction that we're moving our applications from on-prem on to the cloud. And um, obvious reasons that you always hear about the cloud, better scalability, better reliability, and the fact that you can uh, use infrastructure as a service. The other question is why Kubernetes? Well, the main reason we moved Cloud BCI to Kubernetes is because it was optimized for Kubernetes. The build agents, which I talked about before, uh, they work very well as pods. So, you know, a lot of times when you're building an application, you'll run your build job, it'll do what it needs to do, and then it's gonna be quiet for a while. Well, with pods, you can scale them up when you need them, you can run your build, and then when you're done, they can go away. Also, the fact that you can customize images for development teams. When you have uh, these VMs, these physical machines, you've got to install the software that you need beforehand. So uh, if you use pods instead, you can put in different containers that are required uh, within the pod. So if I have one team that's uh, building with certain software and then does testing with other software, I can easily swap in and out different containers in, in the pods to accomplish that. So I don't have to worry about having everything installed beforehand. Pods are easier to patch and to roll back. You know, if something goes wrong, I can just use a previous version of the pod. And the fact that uh, these things are shared and they scaled up and down, that's going to reduce our infrastructure cost. So in preparing for the project, if, if you're doing your own project, um, the first thing I would say is, if you're gonna move to Kubernetes, you wanna take advantage of that move and re-architect what you're doing. Now, in our case, since we were using a third-party application, um, you know, we were limited, we were following their architecture. But if you're, going to build your own application that's currently on-prem and you're going to move that to the cloud or to Kubernetes, you definitely want to look at that architecture and see where you can make changes. Uh, the first piece of advice I would give you, if you don't need to use Kubernetes, then don't use Kubernetes. You know, Kubernetes is a complicated environment. There's a lot to it. And if you have a simple application that maybe just needs to use a few containers or um, could even go serverless, then you probably should consider that. Uh, in my opinion, Kubernetes is not the right environment for doing a lift and shift. And I know there'll be vendors that'll tell you, you know, we can lift and shift and it's very easy with Kubernetes. But again, it all goes back to, if you're gonna make this move, then you really wanna look at your architecture and you wanna see how you can improve it. You wanna take the lessons learned in the past and you wanna apply them in your new design. There's an expression that a, a friend of mine always used to say, and um, it, it goes something like fast, cheap, and good. Uh, pick two, right? With the idea is that you can't do a project fast, cheap, and good at the same time. It's just not possible. Um, but you can choose fast and cheap, you can choose fast and good, or you can choose good and cheap. 
Now, if you're gonna be going to Kubernetes, what I would say is pick good. Whether you pick good and fast, and it's gonna be a little bit more expensive to get it done, or you, chip, or you choose good and cheap, and it's gonna be a little bit slower. Again, Kubernetes is pretty complex, so if you're gonna go that route, choose good, and then one of the other two. All right, when it comes to preparation, uh, there's an expression, uh, rockets are hard. And you know, if you're following all the uh, commercial space travel that's going on, I, I think Thursday, there's actually another uh, SpaceX launch. Um, along the way, you know, there's a lot of mishaps, a, a lot of testing, a lot of explosions. And a lot of times when that happens, you'll, you'll see tweets that'll say, you know, rockets are hard. So what I would add to that is, so is Kubernetes. If you're gonna be doing this project, you really need to make sure you have the expertise to do it. Um, and, you know, as a, as a global FinTech, we've got, we're fortunate in that we've got resources, but, you know, you need to hire the folks with Kubernetes experience. You need to set the proper expectations that it's going to take some time because, again, you want to go back, you want to look at your architecture, you want to do it right. Um, the best way to go about it, in my opinion, is do uh, build a, a minimal viable product and test out some of your ideas. And then start small with that, work with a few trusted customers, whether they're internal or external, and then start iterating based on that work. This way you'll get it right. And as part of the process, you want to document what you're doing, you want to review it, and then you want to test it. So like I said, with the MVP, you want to do a quick POC and test your assumptions. And we actually did that early on. We were thinking of using one type of file system. And then after doing some testing and, and running through it, uh, we realized it wasn't going to work. And so we switched that up and we ended up using something different. So it was good that we uh, did this POC up front before we got too far down the line and then it would be harder to make changes. What I would say is use the native services whenever possible. So a lot of these cloud providers have native services like storage, like databases. Um, you know, figure out what cloud provider you're gonna use and then embrace those native services and use them. It's gonna help you uh, tremendously when it comes to being able to manage and scale and even do things like DR. You wanna plan upfront for disaster recovery. So you don't wanna leave that as an afterthought, especially when it comes to your own architecture. Um, you know, on the one hand, it may be interesting to use a database for some of the storage and then maybe use a network file system for other stuff and then maybe SSDs for a third part of your storage. But then when it comes time to do disaster recovery, when it comes time to do backing up, you have to figure out how am I going to do all that? How am I going to keep it in sync? How long is it going to take to do that? How long is it going to take to restore that? So if you look at disaster recovery up front, when you make some of your choices, you may choose different things to make sure that it's easier to recover. And again, it, you know, it all plays into uh, the type of product, um, the amount of uh, the RTO, the recovery time objective, and the RPO, uh, the recovery point objective. So you know, if you got a product that you need to have an RPO of you know, five minutes, meaning you can only lose five minutes of data, you may make different choices uh, in your architecture than if you have a product that you just have to back it up once a day and that's fine. Now, keep in mind as part of the cloud, you're following a shared responsibility model. Uh, the code and data, uh, the operating system, a lot of times is your responsibility. You know, some of the serverless functions, uh, you don't have to worry about the OS, but still have to worry about the code and the data. 
um, and that the cloud is not magic. So because of the shared responsibility model, you still have to make sure that you're doing proper security, you're doing proper monitoring, and you're doing proper backups. Um, you know, no matter what cloud provider you're using, they've got great uptime, but there is definitely times when they're gonna have problems and uh, you're gonna wanna make sure you plan for that. Now, in our case, a um, couple products we're using, we're using Aqua for our container security. We're using Datadog when it comes to monitoring our clusters and our containers. And then we're using Cast and K10 for backing up our uh, applications. Now, as part of the DevOps team, we obviously follow infrastructure and configuration as code. And what that means is that we're storing our code in version control. And when I say code in this case, it's not the application, but it's the infrastructure. It's the code to build the infrastructure. Um, all that code becomes part of a CI CD pipeline. So everything is auditable and everything is repeatable, right? If you're checking in your code, if you then push it to the pipeline, the pipeline will build the code. It'll push it out to your dev environment. Uh, you'll do some testing. And if everything works, you can then deploy it on up to your QA environment. And again, since it's all the same code, just different data, you know, if it works in dev, it's you're gonna have a good chance that things will work in QA. If you have to make any adjustments, you do that, and then eventually you'll push it up to prod. Now, the idea behind this is you wanna push your problems to the left. Again, another common thing in DevOps, meaning that when you have your configuration as code, you work your problems out in your dev environment and you get it right in dev. Once that's done, you check it in, you capture it, and then you go on to QA. The idea is that by finding your problems early in dev, it's gonna be quicker to fix them and it's gonna be a lot cheaper to fix them. You know, if you have a problem and it makes its way all the way to production, generally what happens is, you know, you've got a fire drill, right? You've got customers that are now impacted. You've got to get all these teams together. You got to figure out a fix. You've got to push the fix quickly, try to test it quickly. Um, where if that same problem is found in dev, the developer can pretty much fix it by themselves. They'll just check it in. It'll run some tests again. and uh, you know, it, it's, it's a lot easier to handle. Another piece of advice I give is don't reinvent the wheel, just improve it. So again, because we're a large global FinTech, we've got resources where we work with a lot of vendors um, and we're able to take advantage of that. You know, where we don't necessarily have uh, certain types of resources, we're able to bring them in as consultants, or even some of the people that we uh, buy products from, you know, they've got a lot of knowledge. For example, working with Kasten, um, they've got a lot of really good Kubernetes people. They understand storage and backup. So some of the issues we were having, we were able to work with them to solve them. Um, and it helped both sides, right? It, it helped us to get a solution but then it helped the vendor because they were able to now understand from their customer's perspective uh, what needed to be done. Again, as I said before, you wanna capture the best practices as code, right? And not just for your product. So what came out of this is that as we were new to Kubernetes and EKS at Broadridge, we were one of the first projects, we work with uh, our cloud team and we ended up building out uh, Terraform modules for EKS. So we basically took best practices, things like um, non-routable sitters for the cluster, uh, things like proper uh, segmentation of the VPC, uh, tagging the right subnets, um, all those problems that we encountered, we ended up putting all that in a Terraform module. So teams later on uh, were able to 
not have those problems. They were able to build off of our knowledge and be able to get up more quickly when it came to EKS. Um, Helm charts. Helm charts is a, a Helm is a CNCF uh, graduated project. Uh, it's at the same level of Kubernetes at this point, and uh, it's considered a package manager for Kubernetes. So if you're not familiar with Helm and you're deploying a Kubernetes, you really wanna become familiar with Helm. It'll become your new best friend when it comes to Kubernetes. Now as a package manager, what happens is, you know, you might think of um, installing software. You know, if, if you're into Linux, RPMs uh, are packages. Uh, with Windows, there's the Windows installer, the MSI file. Well, with Kubernetes, it's very similar. Normally when you're deploying a Kubernetes, you've got this whole collection of YAML files and they describe the services, the pods, the ingress, you know, pretty much everything for your infrastructure. Um, and what Helm does is it takes all those different YAML files, it packages them all together. It then breaks them out where you've got your logic in templates and you've got your values, your data in uh, YAML files. And so again, it lets you deploy across different SDLCs using the same code. So the logic remains the same, and then you can customize the values depending on the environment that you're deploying in. The other great thing about Helm is a lot of third parties publish Helm charts. So for example, CloudBees published a Helm chart for their CI product. So we were able to use their installer without having to figure out how to install it in Kubernetes ourselves. Um, there's a lot of good open source charts available, things like uh, Nginx Ingress. Um, there were different secret managers, DNS, all that good stuff. Um, even Kasten had a Helm chart, uh, Datadog had a Helm chart. So we were able to take advantage of all that. You know, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We didn't write those ourselves. We just used the third party charts. We obviously reviewed them, made sure that they did what we needed to, but then we were able to take advantage of that more quickly. So a couple of things, if we look at what we should have done more differently, or what we should have done differently, I should say. Um, one thing I would say is we should have hired uh, talent faster. So when we initially started with Kubernetes, you know, we, we did some training, we took some online courses, a bunch of reading and Googling. Um, but if we were to do it again, I would say we should have brought the people in with the knowledge sooner and that would have helped the project along faster. The other thing uh, I would say is um, our MVP, we should have defined less features upfront, you know, created a smaller MVP and, and got people using it sooner. So, you know, one of the things we wrestled with was, okay, if we give this to people now and they start using it, but we don't have everything in place, are we gonna get caught, you know, with a problem and then um, not be able to service them properly? Um, and so we put in more features and, and tried to do more things where if I were to do this again, what I would say is, you know, we'll, we'll put the basic features in up front. We'll work with some of those customers and basically tell them, look, it's not ready for production, but we really need to do uh, some basic stuff with it. Um, you know, some stuff that maybe isn't as time sensitive or critical to you because um, we really need the, the feedback. And, you know, that ties into failing faster sooner. So by getting that feedback sooner in the cycle, um, by making the mistakes and making changes sooner, you're not as far down the path with some of those decisions. All right, so if I look at some of the results of this project and the project is still ongoing as far as Cloud BCI is concerned. We've, um, we've got to the point where it's deployed and since we had such a large um, implementation, on-prem implementation, 
you know, we're, we're looking at the best way to uh, bring people over. But if I look at some of the current results, you know, first of all, like I said, we, we were able to re, we were able to build that reusable EKS Terraform module. And that's really increased productivity for a lot of the other teams. You know, we, we were the pioneers, we mapped out the course, and then other people are able to benefit from that. We also built a bunch of reusable Helm charts. So again, you know, we needed monitoring, we needed backup, we needed a DNS. We built out those charts, and as we were building them, we built them in such a way that they were reusable. So other teams are now pretty much, they can drop them right in and get going. Um, we, we wrap third-party Helm charts. So my background, um, I, I was working on Chef before working on this project. And so there's an idea in Chef about wrapping third-party cookbooks. And basically what that means is that you're going to take a, a cookbook somebody else wrote. You're going to not change it, but you're going to write your code around it and include it in your code. And this way, uh, it makes it easy to maintain. So um, I add my logic and my data to my cookbook. I include the other cookbook. And then if an update comes out for the other cookbook, I can just move that in and replace the old one. And then you know, I might have to update some of my code, but for the most part, it's good to go. If you don't wrap something, if you try to modify somebody else's code and then there's an update, now you've got to port all your changes that you made to the new uh, cookbook. Um, so we took that same technique and we wrap third-party Helm charts. So again, when Nginx Ingress comes out with a new chart, we can just drop their new chart, their new version into our chart. And you know maybe we have to update some values or things like that, but we don't have to port any patches or anything like that. So it's a good technique to use. Along those same lines, we developed some Jenkins code that will monitor all those third-party Helm charts. And whenever there's an update, it'll pull those updates down and put them on our uh, internal Helm repository. And so the goal here is that um, you know, we will know, hey, if there's a security fix or new features, we'll know sooner on that it's available and we'll be able to use it. Uh, finally, you know, one of the biggest things that came out of this was uh, we had a requirement to deploy Cloud CD, which is you know, the continuous delivery portion of DevOps. And that was a, a, a new project. Uh, we hadn't used that tool before. So because of the fact that we already had this Kubernetes cluster up and running, because of the fact that CloudBees uh, uses Helm, uh, even for CloudBees CD, we were able to deploy that product very quickly, uh, really in a matter of days. Um, and so again, you know, that was a big win. You know, that really showed that, yeah, once this, this environment is all set up, you can move other stuff into it quickly. So you might ask, what's next? Well, like I said before, you know, we're migrating our internal customers to the new platform and that's ongoing um, and that's gonna take a while. Scaling, you know, scaling is, is still um, something we, we're gonna have to work out uh, as we move more and more of these customers onto this platform, you know, there's different ways to scale things. So uh, we're still working on the best approach to that. Um, building out third-party images. So again, like I said before, when you've got these build agents, you can build images that are used in your pods and you know, we're, we're kind of talking to the customers, understanding their needs and figuring out what those images are. Uh, and then we can just build them and have them available to the customers. Uh, automating the testing, you know, the CI CD pipeline, it's great if you can build stuff automatically, um, but the goal is not only building it, but being able to automatically test it 
and then automatically deploy it. So, you know, we've gotten good at the build part. Now we're working on the automated testing part, uh, and then we can get to automatically deploying things. We've got other groups adopting our code. So as I said before, because of the way we built some of this, we kept that in mind and it's making other people's lives easier. Um, there were people who were part of my team. The team itself, um, we moved over three other uh, applications. There was, you know, at, at times the team was anywhere from around three to eight people. Um, but what would happen as we completed a project, some of the people may have stayed and worked on the next tool, and then some of the people may have gone and worked on other projects. But the great thing is uh, all the skills that they learned throughout this process, the ones who moved on to different teams were able to take these techniques, take the skills they learned, and they were able to start to seed some of these other teams and teach them the proper techniques. So that's something to keep in mind, right? As you're building your team, as you're bringing in new technologies, as you start out with that small group, you wanna bring people on who can then help spread the word, right? You wanna be able to take your techniques, take the right way of doing things and push that out company-wide. And then finally, because of this new approach with containers, we're really using this as a catalyst to rethink how our DevOps pipelines work. So again, instead of having these monolithic agents, you know, we're able to string together different containers. We're able to swap in and swap out different uh, types of testing techniques, different types of build techniques. Um, so it's really helping us rethink how all these pipelines are gonna work. So that's really it as far as my presentation. Um, I've talked about some different technologies. And so here's just a reference. Uh, again, Helm is really the package manager for Kubernetes that we're using. Terraform, if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with Terraform, Terraform allows you to deploy infrastructure to develop infrastructure as code. Uh, and it's used, you know, in our case, we use it with AWS, but they've got different modules for other cloud providers, they even have some Helm and Kubernetes modules. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. EKS, Amazon EKS, that's Amazon's managed Kubernetes service. CloudBees is what I talked about as far as CloudBees CI and CD, the two products that we're using for continuous delivery, continuous integration. Kasten was the backup project that I, uh, product that I talked about. Aqua security is what we use for container security and Datadog is used for monitoring. So that's really the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you all for listening and I appreciate your time. Take care.